Hi all, I'm Glenn and I'm going to talk about my latest GS project which is a Gopher client for Commoner GS. Normally when I come to the shows and give a talk about something I've been working on, I like to show something that's completely finished and ready for release, but this one was a little more ambitious. So I have to do like they do at the big uh, conferences and put up a slide that says technology preview. In other words, I'm not releasing it just yet. All the hard stuff is done and it just needs some, some uh, polishing up, so I'm thinking a few weeks I'll release it and as always with the source code. So who am I? Um, been a GS user for a very long time. I've always had a Commodore 64 set up and I've always had GS running. And I, I famously tracked my stock options in GeoCalc while I was still working. So I'm, I'm a really seriously hardcore dedicated GS user. Also, as far as I know, I'm the only person ever to have written a virus for GS. <laughs> there really is such a thing. Yes, it works. No, you may not have a copy. <laughs> <clears throat> and I maintain a comprehensive set of GS pages on my website. One of the things there is a tips and tricks page for people who want to learn GIOS programming. So if you're interested in that, have a look at that page and it's been updated quite a bit while I was working on this project. There's some new things I came across. <coughs> there are a lot of things there that you, know, you won't find in the manuals. You would only learn it through trial and error, mostly error. <clears throat> so we've had network uh, interfaces for the Commodore 64, what, almost almost a decade now, I think. And uh, of course, the first ones were not so good, those horrible CS8900 cards that required a TCP stack, TCP IP stack running on the Commodore 64, which is kind of a joke. Um, <clears throat> but now we have some newer ones. I'm going to be uh, demoing this on a, on a flyer, the flyer network card. How many, know, how many people know what that is or, and or have one? Yeah. It's a shame that you can't get new ones anymore. Um, but to answer the first question that'll come up from the audience before I even, before anybody even ad, asks it, yes, I wrote it in such a way as, as so you could write drivers for other devices. It's completely separated and there's a jump table at the beginning of the driver. So it should theoretically be possible to write something for other, other network cards. <clears throat> but anyway, when all these network cards started coming out, the question was always, well, you know, what, what exactly are we going to do with it? And a lot of those cards, to be honest, they're not much more than glorified RS-232 to TCP IP converters. But what do we really need that for? You know, grab a Raspberry Pi and run TCP SIR on it, and boom, you're done, right? I, I, I think it's more important to be writing apps that actually do socket programming on the network, because you can get more creative and do more interesting things with it. People have written, as we know, IRC clients, and you know you could do FTP, whatever else. But at the beginning, you know, there were some false starts, and for a while, it seemed like everybody was thinking a web browser on the Commodore 64. Man, that would be great. That would be impossible, is what it would be. Okay, a web browser on the Commodore 64. You're going to spend 99% of your time dropping 99% of the bytes that the server sends because you can't do anything with them anyway. So. <clears throat> like I said, FTP, IRC, and of course, there's another older protocol called Gopher. How many people know what Gopher is? Ooh, a lot of, I can see why you guys came to this talk. How many people have used Gopher? Oh, look at that, fantastic. How many people were using it in the early 90s? Oh, oh, oh almost all the hands stayed up. Great, great. <clears throat> well, Gopher is ideal for these old machines because the protocol is extremely simple. Not only is it easy to write a Gopher client, it's easy to write a Gopher server. And that's what I ended up doing is writing both. Um, yeah, so why not write a client for a protocol that can actually be implemented on this machine is the idea. And the result was GeoGopher. Um, and the intent for this program is to have a for really, for really real G, uh, Gopher client that will allow you to go out there and browse Flood Gap and Quux and whatever the, the Gopher sites that are out there that are still good. But I also added some special sauce to make it good for GIOS users and it allows you to download GIOS files, more about that in a minute. I want it to be compatible with Gopher servers, but I'm not going past the original 
RFC, so there's not going to be any Gopher Plus and whatever the cool things people are working on now. I know people are working on Gopher support for TLS and Tor and, oh, please, come on. <laughs> yeah, we don't need that. So a little bit about GeoGopher and how it works. There are two parts to what I did. I wrote a, a server in Java <clears throat> that I'm going to be connecting to, and it's, it's on, back on my computer table in Milwaukee. <coughs> it's running it's, uh, at lionlabs.org. And what it does is, if you're presented with a list of GS files to download, they're actually being seen from inside a disk image. All this is running off of disk images on my server. And it looks inside the disk images, finds the file that you want, streams it over the network. How many people remember downloading GS files in the old day? I, I should have asked how many GS users in here. I know there's some. A few. Yeah, not, more people have used Gopher than GS. Get this. OK. Uh, but in the old days, if you wanted to download a GS file, of course, the problem is that GS files are not a contiguous chain of sectors. There's a header block that goes somewhere else, and many of the files are multi-chain files, the VLIR files. So how do you send that over the wire? And there was a popular format at the time called convert format or CBT format that was a, just a pretty straightforward way to string it all together in a known order so that you could send a continuous stream of bytes over the wire. And that's what I've done, only it's doing it on the fly. As the server reads an individual file out of a disk image, it's converted into the CVT format. And as the client receives it, he looks at it. And in the first few bytes, if he sees that CVT header, he goes, oh, it's a, it's a CVT file. I'm going to turn it into a regular native GS file and put it on this diskette. If somebody on their PC using a regular Gopher client connected and clicked on one of those files, he would get a binary, but it would be the CVT format. You could actually take that CVT format, take it from your PC, put it on a Commodore 64, run the convert program, and get a GS file out of it. But I'm doing it all on the fly. And of course, the obligatory don't do cross development on your Commodore 64 slide because I'm totally against that sort of thing. I can see if you're running an op if you're writing an operating system, you know, or one of these huge games or something like this. But if you're writing an app, for God's sake, work on the machine. What you know? What's the point otherwise? Why are we here? Because we love these old machines. So work on the machine, and that's what I did. Right now, it's about uh, I think last time I counted, it was a little over 4,000 lines of assembler. And you know how it is. You, you all know the drill. Who, those of you who are programmers, you start small. You write one little piece. You add another little piece onto that. And each time I'm writing it, I'm writing it by hand on a clipboard with my beloved Pentel click eraser at my side. And when I get enough code, I key it in in GeoWrite you know, to get a, a source file. I build it. I test it using GeoDebugger. And uh, you know, eventually, I get something that <laughs> runs, hopefully. <laughs> and I do cheat a little. I don't want anybody to think that I'm an extremist. One of the things I do as part of my backup procedures is every night I take the source files only, not, not everything, graphics and everything else, but I just take the source file, copy them to a floppy disk, and make a D64 of the floppy. Then I've got a program I wrote that looks at that image takes all the GeoWrite files, converts them to text files on the PC, so now I can grep through them. So as I'm coding, you know, I've already got 4,000 lines. I'm adding, a new, I'm adding a new routine. I need a new variable for this. And I'm going to call it uh, gopher blah blah, whatever. Oh, geez, did I use that name? Have I used that name yet? Well, it's a little easier to grep through the whole source code. And also, it's easier just to find things. Where did I put that one routine? And you start grepping through the source code. So it's, so it's not like I'm totally against using the PC to help, but you know, the PC should be the slave and to the Commodore and not get too uppity, right? <laughs> A little bit about Gopher Protocol. Uh, Gopher Protocol is very, very simple, like I said, and it sends lines of text over the wire. And each line of text is either something to display or something you can <coughs> click on to get a result. And this is basically what it looks like. <clears throat> there are four fields in every gopher item. The first one tells you what type it is, plus a display string. And I'll show a, 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 an example in a second. Then there's the selector, which is sort of like a link. It's what you send to the server 
to, to tell him, here's what I want you to do or what, what I want you to get from me. And then you're also sending a host and a port. And that's, that's important because what it means is just like with the World Wide Web, you can be on a Gopher server, click on a link, and it'll take you somewhere completely different on a different machine, who knows where. And here's a simplified example of a Gopher map. The, the fields are delimited by tab characters, and I just replaced them with, I think I have a laser pointer here, yeah. I just replaced them with the double pipe symbol to make it easier to read. So the first one is just an informational text that would be displayed to the user at the beginning. And so it doesn't have anything in those last three fields. The second one is a text file. It's type zero. Text files are type zero, so you can see the first character is a zero, and then here's the display string that the user would see. Here's the selector that would be sent to the server to grab it, and then of course the, the uh, host name and the port. So these are some of the types, zero for text, a subdirectory is one, search is nine, and binary, or excuse me, search is seven and binary is nine. Here is a well-known gopher site called FloodGap, and how many people know who Cameron Kaiser is? He's a Commodore guy from way back, and he's one of the leading lights in the Gopher community. And this is his site here. And you can see at the beginning, what we have here is a whole bunch of those type I items. And so there's no, there's no indication of a link or anything because it's just meant to display to the user. Now, I looked at this and I said to myself, you know, in GIOS, we've got a problem here because there's an awful lot of stuff to scroll through and it would be nice if there was a way to minimize the scrolling. So I took all these informational items and collapsed them into one after I got them into memory. And I'll show you how that works in a minute. But this text file, if you were to hit enter on line 18 there where the cursor is, it would clear the screen and display that text in a pager. Now, there are a number of different ways to do this. Gopher protocol is wide open. You can display stuff any way you want. Uh, Cam Kaiser also wrote a plugin for Firefox called Overbyte. Get it? Gopher Overbyte. And that allows you to see Gopher sites in native Gopher protocol from within Firefox. Here's the same thing. You can see all that informational text that we're seeing at the beginning. And you can see, though, that he's got an indicator with a plus sign that this is a text file. And if you were to click on that, you would see that he displayed it in place within a frame with a scroll bar, as opposed <coughs> to doing what the, text, the console client does, which is just clear the screen and display nothing but the text. And so I took it a step further and took all of these informational items and collapsed them and it looks like this. This first item is all of those 8 or 10 or 12 lines and then you just click on the word bubble to make them all expand. So now it's time for the demo to show that a little in a little more detail. Okay, so uh, for the curious, I'm running off a of micro IEC, and my second drive is is nothing. I knew I forgot something when I set up. This will just take a second. <coughs> we need a RAM drive. Whoops. Well, that's okay, but I prefer the bigger one as long as I've got the memory. Okay. Okay, so my first drive is the micro IEC, and the second drive is the uh, uh, RAM expander. So I'm going to go and fire up GeoGopher. And since I'm a coward, I'm going to do it in the debugger. <laughs> so this won't support the micro IEC? Pardon me? Does this support the micro IEC then? Well, the Gopher thing really has nothing to do with the uh, micro IEC. It, I, micro IEC is well supported under GEOS. Sorry, no, what I meant, I, wrong, wrong product, the uh, C64 NIC. I'm, I'm sorry. Can I use a C64 NIC with this with GeoGopher? Do you have to use one of the other C products? Right now, it only supports the flyer, okay. right? 
And I, I wouldn't recommend <coughs> trying to make it work with the old CS8900 cards, the, the RNAT family of cards. I would not even recommend that because you're going to run out of memory instantly by putting a TCP IP stack in your Commodore 64. Not to mention that it runs too slow and you end up with overruns and everything else. Yeah. Really, the only way to do networking on a Commodore 64 is to have something that has either like the Ethernet with the WizNet chip or the, the, the newer breed of ESP chip based uh, wireless ones. Yeah. I just bought one of Bo Zimmerman's wireless modems, so that's probably going to be the next thing to support if I can get it to work. Uh, okay, so here we are in one of the most glorious pieces of software ever written, the GS debugger. <laughs> It is. I mean, you know, if you start disassembling code, notice you're seeing labels. You're, n you're not just seeing hex addresses, you're seeing labels. So. And here it is. So what I'm going to do, I'm, I'm first going to show uh, flood gap, which I just showed. Oops. Oh, no, I'm not going to do that. Gee, I hope this program is re-entered. I guess not. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry, I have to do it one more time because there is really a reason that I'm going to run in the debugger. I guess the main complaint about GS is usually that it's so slow. I mean, we can see how slow it is, right? I'm restarting it again and again and taking up just a couple of seconds of your time. <coughs> All right, let's fire this up. And this time, instead of immediately quitting, <laughs> I'm going to connect to a server. So you can see here the standard create, open, quit dialog, which I laboriously recreated. And here are some. Here's flood gap, which I think we can do by IP or by name. Now, as I said, it's not quite finished, and there's a lot of a lot of little polishing that needs to be done. Giving some more user feedback at this point would be one of the things. But here we are, and you can see that there was that whole kind of wall of text at the beginning that's all squished down into here, so that we're mis minimizing the amount of scrolling we're doing. But if we click on the word balloon, we get the whole works. And it does not yet support a lot of things. It doesn't support downloading text files, for example. But that's coming. That's easy. That's the easy part. Downloading the GS files was the hard part. Um, so yeah, it supports the, the Gopher, uh, Gopher sites that are already out there in Gopher space. Now I'm going to do something more GS specific, and I'm going to connect to my own server. which, like I say, it's running at home in my machine room. And here we go. Now, I made sure that I could do this, descend into a subdirectory, and come back out again. This is using, for those of you who know Gopher, this is just using standard Gopher map without any of the extensions that you can have on the server side. And this is another thing that I want to add, which is search. Search is the thing in Gopher, right? I mean, even without Archie and Veronica, there are search things that you can click on, and you should get a text, uh, text field saying, what do you want to search for? It should find the results and send them back as Gopher items. I definitely want to do that. I'd like to index all the GS stuff on my site and make it available through Gopher. But this subdirectory contains disk images. Okay. So here's a D64, here's a D81, I think this is a D81 as well. So let's descend into this D81 and see what we get. So at this point, the server is going, looking inside the file, looking inside the disk image, and finding all the GS files on there. And it's going to display them to us with the file name and the contents of the info block. So now if you want to download some GS files, you just look and, oh, yeah, this is what, yeah, that's the one, one, one I want, as opposed to downloading a bunch of disk images and then having to dig through them and see, is this what I want, is this not what I want, I'll throw it away, whatever. 
And by the way, of course, the scroll bar, there is no such thing in GIA, so it's hand-coded. That's about five pages of assembly right there to get the scroll bar. So this is the one I've been demoing to be safe. I'm going to use the same one that I've been testing with all the time. This is the little utility, which is a block availability map uh, displayer for GS. And when I click on it, the server is going to go out there, extract it out of, the, out of the disk image, change it into convert format on the fly, spit it out over the wire, and when it gets down here to the Commodore 64, he's going to look at that and go, oh yeah, it's in convert format. I'm going to put the header over here, I'm going to put the, you know, the right, right bytes in the directory where they belong and everything. So I click on it and here it goes. He's downloading it, he's downloading it, he's downloading it. And now we got it. We got the file. So if I exit the program at this point, another thing of course, oh, that's okay. Another thing, of course, that it should do is ask you, you know, where would you like to put this? Right now it's hard-coded to put things on the second drive. Uh, I'm going to go back in after I show you this because there was, uh, there was, after all, a reason I wanted to run it in the debugger outside of being a coward. So here now we are on drive B, and this is the file we just downloaded. You can see it's got the proper icon, and if we look at the info block, this is the same text that we saw in the directory listing. So everything looks good. Thank you, John F. Howard, for writing this. And we'll see that when, when we click on it, it runs normally. There's a BAM display of a commoner 1541 RAM drive. So the one other thing I wanted to show I'm going to blow this away as long as I'm at it. There's a bug there, and I'm not going to tell you what it is because it's too embarrassing. So. I, I just wanted to show what it would look like if I weren't smooshing all those info items together into one. Um, and to do that, it's pretty easy. No, I'm not going. Again, just show me the code at the routine get items. Right? And that's where it squishes them, normalize info items. So I'm going to overwrite that with no ops. <coughs> and now you'll see that if I wasn't doing that, Okay, we have all of these now are separate, which is all fine and dandy, but you know, before we didn't even have to scroll at all, and now we do. Right, so if I put that back, yeah, you can see all these here, all these, this just says, this is go for item number, number eight, number nine, number 10, number 11, that was just for testing. <clears throat> and if I go back in there and replace that line of code, No, no, it's norm info. And then ask for that, ask to connect again, will seem squished up. Okay, so now no scrolling necessary. So that's why I did that. And then if you click on it, you can still see everything. There's, you can see my wrap test. And the same one here. There were all these, all these were on separate lines, and I've made it more, more efficient to use on a Commodore 64. So that's it. Like I say, there are, there are, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a bit more to come. I want to add search. I want to add download of text files and paging of text files. As a matter of fact, I think I've got a slide with, yeah, here are the things I want to add. Yeah, only works with GS files. Got to have a device chooser. Say, where would you like to download this to, and what drive do you want to put it on? Pager window. I want to do go for search. Uh, on the server side, I've got a program that generates go for maps, which is kind of touchy because of the tab characters in there. 
if you get just one of those wrong, your client is going to go nuts, right? And uh, of course, bug, fi bug fixing? There couldn't be any bugs in this program. It's a GS program. Yeah, bug fixing, and, and uh, there's not a lot of very good air handling in there either. But all of this stuff is just a matter of no more than a few weeks' work, uh, worth of work. The, the hard part is done, and the hard part is streaming that stuff over the wire and getting a GS file out the other end. Uh, here are some resources. When the slides are published, you'll be able to see all this stuff. Um, and like I said, if you want to experience Gopher natively, here's one way. If you're, if you're running Linux, just install a program called Gopher. That's, that's the console-based one that, that I showed within the black screen. And of course, then there's the, the Overbyte plugin for Firefox, which is in a bit of trouble because Firefox is changing their APIs. And yeah, so he's, he's having a little problem with that. I don't know where that's going to end up, but for now it works. Okay. Um, well, that was it. Okay. <laughs> any questions? Does anybody have any questions about this, how it works, plans for the future, all that kind of stuff? Yeah. How much memory do you have to work with for loading the directory? If you ever run into a problem loading, how much it would Well, that's <laughs> I mentioned that it could use better error handling. Right now, there's no check for end of buffer overflow. <laughs> but uh, I think we're still in the debugger here. Yeah. Oh, I don't know what that is. Uh, so right now, you've got the resident module, you've got the flyer driver sitting on top of it, and at the very end is this label here, font load, which tells it where to load that little tiny font. And that's probably another K or so after that. So it's going up to probably maybe, I don't know, to no more than 26, 2700 hex. And on GS, you have, if you're using the background screen like I am, you have from there up to 6,000 hex. So that's, that's a, yeah, that's a fair amount of memory. But, you know, like I said, I wanted to implement a text scroller. Obviously, I'm not going to keep the whole text file in memory. So it's going to have to be a forward-only scroller for text files. Uh, otherwise, bad things could happen. Any other questions? Yeah? Not knowing the flyer and how it works, how, how do you talk to it? Looks like plugging the serial bus and talk to it? Or? Yeah, the flyer implements networking over the IEC serial port, and it, it uses, it, it answers on drive number seven, device number seven. And you just send a command to it, like open 272, quote, HTTP colon, or whatever. Or in this case, th there's also an API to open raw sockets. And something somebody else asked before, too, could you write a Gopher server for the Commodore 64? Well, yes, you could if you had the right network card. The, the uh, <laughs> flyer card does, in fact, support server sockets. So if you have the right card that'll do that, yeah, you could write a Gopher server on the 64. That would be kind of neat, have a server on one and a client on the other, and they'd be talking to each other. Any other questions? OK, thank you for your kind attention.